Thanks for the intro <clears throat> and thanks for coming and thanks for inviting me. This is, uh, I think, a very exciting workshop and it was, I was actually quite uh, puzzled to come in the first part and then the second part and see that kind of the, the average age kind of dropped by, by half. <laughs> And that I'm going to speak in the second part, I think, is, is uh, maybe a, uh, or I, I hope it's an indication that what, what I'm representing is, is still relevant and, and might, might actually give you some food for thought. Analysis ready data. So uh, what do, how, where did we start off? I mean, when we talk about analysis ready data today, you have to look at guys like me and you have to remember that not so long ago, this was how we started off with, with Earth observation data. And everyone was at that point happy that data were operable and saying thank you. Nowadays, of course, we see that we are in the, in the petabyte, we are in the, in, the, in the range where stuff is coming up more and more and data are no longer enough. So people ask for a lot more than just inter, not only operable, they have to be interoperable and whatever that means is, is expressed in this workshop in a fantastic way by a lot of terms that all basically in one way or the other have a similar kind of idea. We want that stuff to work together. So how do you do that? What is interoperability actually? And, and how can we get closer to it? And ultimately that is the goal of, of ARD. So that's why I put this slide in here and trying to give you an idea how we're trying to address this interoperability issue in this, in this big groups like OGC and, and, and CEOs, to which I will come in a second. So when you read this definition, you will find that there is this technical, organizational, semantic, legal. So there are, some, there are different aspects, which, which we call factors of interoperability. Keep in mind that interoperability uh, will only work if all these things play together, a single, a single, uh, uh, break a single uh, a failure in one of these aspects might make the other ones void. So who are the ones responsible for that? I already said that in Earth observation in our communities, there are essentially two major players. I'm not listing GEO here because honestly, I haven't seen GEO very active in really shaping this interoperability. Uh, but if, if you're happy with that, I would, I would uh, of course include them. That is the Open Geospatial Consortium. And that is the, the Committee of Earth Observation Satellites, with which both together are now the ones that are the main drivers for, for the ARD, as we, as we kind of know it in, 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 the, in the development of what we call a standard. Within CEOs, when we were talking more about interoperability, and because we were acknowledging that interoperability is a complex systemic issue, we were, we were basically coming to this interoperability frameworks. Interoperability frameworks were not invented for that. Interoperability frameworks exist for, I think, two decades in administration. And they basically do the same thing. They, they separate the concerns of interoperability into blocks that have some sort of common characteristics. And then you can start uh, discussing and addressing them with the right audience, with experts in the respective fields. <clears throat> so that the ones that, and this is still in draft, so might change, but the ones that we kind of isolate, have, have singled out in, in the framework for, for, for CEOs, for Earth observation was the semantics, the architecture, the interfacing, quality and policy. So these are these factors that we want to kind of, of cover when we, when we address interoperability. And what I will do in the, in the rest of these talks is actually talk primarily about the first two of those. There is a lot to say about the others. I think we, we heard a lot about the interfacing part. We didn't hear so much about semantics and, and architecture. And that's why I think I will put a bit of an emphasis on that. Briefly, analysis ready data, and I will... Uh, uh, not, not lose too much time because many of you will know that it has, it has an history, it has a certain ambition to basically make this data available. That's the current status of what we call the CEOs ARD. So that's the ARD as we implemented in CEOs with uh, so-called product uh, uh, family specifications on land, on coastland and, and water. So it has expanded. It was only land a few years ago. Now we have uh, opened to other areas. And there already you see the first kind of problems coming up because not all these products are really fitting to one of these categories. And if you look how they are defined, some of them are 
parameters like surface reflectance and other ones are more sensor technical oriented like uh, like the, the the SAR ones which basically treat treat a class of sensors and not really just one 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 property of the surface <clears throat> uh, why is it going towards standards so ARD is in in the form of, of the seals ARD with these uh, kind of informal specifications that that are of course uh, 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 something that, that users can or cannot, and also within CEOs, the agencies are not obliged to can or cannot. It doesn't really have a, an authoritative character. And that's why at that point, CEOs and OGC kind of teamed up and, and said, okay, we're going to put that into a standard. But of course, if you want to put that into a standard, then you might have to go beyond just what CEOs was needing because uh, uh, ARD is of course in the core a standard for geospatial data and not only for earth observation data. And if you would separate the two, the interoperability that you want to achieve would be kind of screwed from the beginning because ultimately both need to grow together. So a quick update on what is going on. The group was set up in basically uh, uh, first uh, uh, half of this year. There was this, this usual approval procedures. Everything is kind of very formal. And, and now we even have a number, so it's going to be 19176. And the point at which we are now, and that's where I will actually go into, into substance, is, is the part one. And the part one will, will define on what categories of ARD we will have in the future. So how are we going to cut the cake? So this is a question of architecture, but before I get into this, and this is slides I actually didn't want to show, but going through the conference, I thought this must, this must be somehow put to, to, to attention here. Terminology, semantics. When you, when you want interoperability, the first thing you have to make crystal clear is, the, is the, the, that what you talk about is understood by the one you talk to in the way it, you, you mean it. And that you can only do if you have a clear definition of your, of your terminology. A few examples here, and I will not uh, spend too much time on those. It shouldn't be an issue. There are, uh, uh, plenty of, of glossaries, but I give you an example for remote sensing. Might not be enough time to read it, but uh, just read the one of Inspire and you see that maybe there is, not everything is, is perfect in this world. Another one, and that's maybe even more relevant for this conference, we heard in situ. I don't know in how many, in how many occasions and in how many different rooms. I'm not sure what people had in mind when they were talking about that. But if you don't define it as a specific class with specific properties, and you later want to set standards for it, you will have a problem because if there are not common characteristics, it will be very difficult to, to, to standardize it, to make it something that, that is recognizable. And uh, observation, another one I wanted to have on a slide, maybe you read that in all peace and quiet at home. I, the colored uh, thing down there, the implementation of an algorithm as an observer does have a consequence. And that's, that's actually the, uh, I think the fourth line on this slide here, yes. So, but, but let's start from the beginning. In situ, I already said, if you want in situ to be recognizable, you have to make sure you, you, you define it in a way that, that the others share. I'm not so happy with the remote sensing definitions of some people. There is, there is certainly the relation between remote and in situ, which is kind of in our community thought to be kind of the, the antagonists is something that is only in this community. If you go a bit out in, 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 into the standardizers, in ISO, it's a completely different thing. Things can be remote and in situ at the same time, there is no problem. And, and if we, of course, now want to establish a standards, we will have to make sure that, that these things are being clarified. Then uh, none of these vocabularies that I showed are, sorry, are really, are really easy to use. They are not really uh, something that you would that you would find very uh, uh, pleasant to, to, to read. <clears throat> so it is something that that I think is an issue because <clears throat> if, if only experts can read glossaries, then, then we, we, we have a problem. So what we proposed in CEOs that we want to change that. Of course, the problem is exactly this. If the, the, the tens that the 10 or the many that don't work, you, you create another one, you will have one more that doesn't work. <clears throat> so here's a, a short list of things how I think you could do it differently. And this is the, something that, that we will discuss, that we will propose to CEOs, that we will discuss with OGC, where, where of course 
Also, a lot depends on how much support that gets from the user side, because if people don't care, nothing is going to change and nothing will happen. But we want, we want essentially vocabularies that are easy to read, that people uh, can take as instructive, that, can, that are machine, that are, are basically uh, <clears throat> uh, hierarchical, so that all the terms built on each other, that, that things are really relatively easy to trace. You can implement it in a, in, and that will be a real game changer. You can implement it for all, uh, replacing the old ones only if you get the commitment of all the major stakeholders to really follow them. And that means essentially they have to all take, uh, give it up. That's the idea also of an interoperability framework is that uh, a component that you don't, you cannot cover yourself. You basically collect somewhere else where, where the experts are and you rely on them to manage it for you. And that is something for the vocabularies I think we will have to do. And, and that, is, that is an idea of how that could be done. It has to be, of course, machine readable. It has to be free and open, a Wikipedia style thing where we collect our ideas. Only then we have a chance to really get out of this jungle. Okay, how are we doing with time? Good, architecture. Architecture is probably even more difficult as semantics because semantics is Kind of, most people understand it's necessary, but architecture, many people intuitively say, oh, we, it, it, we, we have it. Like the, the first thing for ARD, which we need to address is how we cut the cake, as I said. An obvious way and, and kind of an intrinsic way how it's already done is this pro processing level idea. So the value change has these levels. You probably all have seen this in one way or the other. It's there for ages. But you have to keep in mind it comes from a specific background. It comes from the 90s. It comes from actually these, these ideas that I had on my first slide. So pr processing single scenes and, and doing things in a very uh, kind of uh, sequential way. And this is what we, what we were ending up with. And because it had this kind of specific history, it of course was not equally adaptive to all the other sensor types that, we, that meanwhile are, 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 are common practice and, 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 and basically volume wise are more and more taking over. A possibility to do things differently is again, separating concerns, thinking what, are, what is actually the operations you need to do in pre-processing. And, and there are two dimensions in, in, the, in, the, in the value chain that we could separate. The one is the development of the measurement. So just strictly speaking, what do we do to the parameter as we, as we, as we uh, process it along. And the other one is the geometry. So where, where, there, where the, do we, what do we do to the sample that we originally have taken with the sensor and it ultimately ends up in some spatial unit that has an, a usage for the, for the customer, for the user. And if you see it like that, of course, the idea would be to build a matrix. That, and if you build a matrix, first of all, make sure that then the different axes have a good meaning. The separation must be clear. So I call this in, in the order of the part that matters. That's really the one, actually, the, the left, upper and le leftmost uh, column and row are, are, I think, not really relevant. So we start with this 1B. Sensor calibration, anyhow, must. That means basically you go from digital numbers to some physical uh, 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 values, then target calibrated. That means if it was remotely sensed, you, you process it down to a specific feature or target that you want to describe. And that, that, is, that is a very important step because at that point you will become comparable to data that are taken at that object. And that is what many people call in situ. So an in situ data would be automat automatically here the level two. And that's, the, that's where, you could, where you could start uh, uh, bringing them into the value chain. Then, you need, then the next level to me is homogenization. Homogenization essentially means taking the sensor out of the data making the data sensor agnostic. So if you think of temperature, temperature, if you measure it with, uh, with a radiometer, it's apparent temperature in, in radiative terms. At the level of, of, of homogenization, it should be degrees Celsius off the surface. And then it doesn't matter whether you measure it with a thermometer or with a radiometer or with, with, with whichever type, or if, if you model it, at that point, you can start fusing all these different uh, 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 <clears throat> tracks. And then, of course, you can go further, you can model things, you can do the uh, derivation, and all this you can, in theory, do without touching the original sample. So it is independent of, of geometry. However, of course, because 
all those things come in and it's very, this first level here, the B level here is essentially the point cloud that's irregular samples distributed somewhere in, this, in space. So if you want to, 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 to organize things, you will have at some point to, to rectify them. And then as we all know, it, there might be regretted once or even twice. But I think we all agree that at the latest, at the, at the second resampling, which will be the third resampling of the, of the original sample after the rectification, which is also a resampling, the data are essentially gone. So we should keep track of that. It's important that we, that we for every value that we treat, remember how often it was going through resampling because otherwise we might get very funny results. So uh, you could populate this and you could of course say there is much more variety in this than just the, the standard levels as we know. Now you could imagine we go along the georeferenced line up to homogenization. That's by the way, what imaging spectrometer people want to do. They say our spectra, talk to the SPG guys in, in the US, future sensor. They say we will never resample a spectrum until we have analyzed it because the subtle features all get lost if we start to, to mess with, uh, with, uh, with the resampling, with the interpolation, which in one way or the other you have to do. So they say, we want to also rectify only at level three. So they go a certain path for other sensors might go other paths. In the end, it should be a matter of uncertainty. The best path is the one that gives you at your destination, the lowest uncertainty. And that should, that should drive the building of processing chains. And that defines of course, also categories of ARD. So that, that, that's kind of my proposal in the sense that you also see that of course, at each level, the readiness is one targeted as a, sp at a specific purpose. And the term analysis in this, in this sense becomes a, a, a different meaning because there are many different ways of analyzing data. And there is what I call here the fusion, uh, the, the conflation combination of, of data is in a way all, all processing, but the real analysis of the data usually should happen at a level where you have taken the effect of the sensor out that should become the standard. And, and that is something that, that you, you could express, for example, by, by allocating the term analysis to a, certain, to a certain level and call the other level something that, that gives the user a guidance of what to do at which level. That was the first part of architecture. Time is still looking good because this is the more, the more difficult one. Another aspect of architecture is in, 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 in interoperability is when we process, what do we mean when we bring data together? When are data comparable? Usually they are comparable if they describe the same sample, the same piece of the surface. To do that, we usually co-register. We, we build grids. First, we make it regular, as said, for enabled processing, you all know that. And then if you bring other data to it, you usually try to have them co-gridded. And that of course means that we have a, a connection between interoperability and the spatial representation. These things somehow go together. Everything else is, is very difficult. If you work with point clouds, you can in theory create an interoperability of these, of these kind of irregularly uh, distributed blobs, but that is going to be numerically much more uh, 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 difficult than if you have a regular grid. Mathematics become much easier there. So that is what uh, I think I went a bit ahead of my own slides. So in, in a cube, we kind of inherently, and I have heard differently because there is meanwhile, uh, what, the, what do they call that virtual cubes? But normally even a virtual cube only becomes an operable cube once you fulfill the same grid paradigm. Once you have the samples co-located, then you can start uh, uh, working through that dimension uh, 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 orthogonal to, to, to the space. So co-greeting is an important element within a data cube, but what happens between data cubes? So when, when it is important within for interoperability, why should it matter less between? And if you, if you think of merging or working with two data cubes, if they don't share the same spatial discretization, then working on A first and then on B and on B first and then on A will give you a slightly different result. Going from A to B and back, will make the result worse because you will have to resample twice. And you will basically resample data to a different system that, that then in some derivative you resample back. And this is, 
if you would trace that in the matrix as I proposed previously, you would find that you, you, you kind of hit the bottom. You, you, you come to the point where you have had two or three uh, uh, resamplings that definitely will affect the signal that you originally recorded. So you will have to, 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 to consider whether this was the best possible path. So an obvious way to, to, to get around that would be common grids. Of course, common grid, grids means common grids systems. This is just the, what happens to changing. I think I will skip this. I said enough about the disadvantages of resampling. So if you want, instead of point clouds, to have discrete grids, then you will have to look into making these grids more harmonized. And of course, it doesn't, it, it's not enough to do that at one resolution, at one grid. You will need grid systems. You will need to, to offer to the users different, different granularities, different cell sizes. How do you do a, a spatial discretization? Before you start actually jumping on a grid, you should think, what is it what I'm doing? And what, what is good practice? What makes a grid solution a good solution? So here are a few points that I collected at a, at a, at a seminar I was doing with some experts uh, eight years ago. So, so those are points that they said that is something that good grids have. Of course, one thing is that goes, there is this good child criteria paper you might, you might heard of. I should have put the reference here. Very good paper talking about what global grids should, should do. And these things, of course, you cannot have all, all at the same. So you will have to make compromises. The, the grids we know all make compromises. I mean, this is a very famous one, the WMTS, which is still in use and which is, of course, has the one, it's, it's a fantastic system in terms of it's hierarchic, it's nicely nested, it, it, it's for, for operations, it's great. But you, if you want to really have a global coverage, you, you, you use as much uh, storage for Antarctica as you use for the whole rest of the populated world. And this is, of course, not a very efficient way. That's a distortion issue. So this is something that for that reason alone is an issue. We all know this one and some suffer under it. And uh, it has, one has to know, of course, this has been developed in the 50s as a paper map scheme by the US Army. That's why it's called the military grid reference uh, system. That is being used for Sentinel. It's UTM based, but it's not one grid, it's 60 grids. If you work across large areas at higher latitudes, you all know what happens. It's, it's probably not the ultimate solution. And I'm very glad that the colleague from EODC has written that paper in really pinpointing to, to what this does to data and that this might have been not the best possible solution just because it was an available solution. What they did at EODC, and that's maybe why they shoot against MGRS, is they found a better way to do things with the Equi-7. They basically said, let's take each continent and at least keep the data there together, minimize distortions. It makes less partitions, as we say, less, less uh, projections, less. That's what it looks in the references there, but there are other ways, ways, ways to do things. And, and, and I think it's important before we design the systems for the next 100 petabytes that we're going to create over the, over the next six or seven years, we should think about how we store them. And one possibility is what, what is called DGGS. The biggest disadvantage of DGGS is, is that they do standards yet because no data exists and if you ask why no data are produced in that system, you will get the answer. There is no software for, for reading them. And if you talk to the software guys, why is there no software? They tell, oh, no one is producing the data like that. That, that discussion I'm having since about 10 years now. On the other hand, if you, if you design a system like for the future, you should have these things in mind. If you want, want quadrilateral cells, if you, the only choice you have to, to fill a cube without gaps is, uh, to fill a, 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 an ellipsoid without gap is a cube. You put the cube inside and you map on the faces. If you, if you then want it to be hierarchical, there's only two options in, in rectangles, and that is division by four or division by nine. The other ones we rule out because they, they, um, they surely give two, two big steps. And this already means a step of nine would mean a resolution factor of three and an area of almost 10. This is probably a step that is too big for earth sciences to be done at, at the discrete level. So there would be no intermediate grids. So probably four is the only thing that, that is acceptable. 
And if you count that all together, you already now could know what the resolutions in a really global system would be that you can sustain. And, and they are those. That will not change much. Of course, it matters how you project on, on the faces. It matters uh, uh, how you uh, how you exactly organize the system and, and tailor and tailor the distortions. There, there will be some, some, some percentages up or down, but the principle will not change. It's not gonna be 30% different from what you see there at no point. And, and this is what I don't understand and neither from the computer people that work with the data nor from the sensor people that, that build the systems for the future why they don't look at these things and say, why don't we build the sensors in a way that they feed the system in which we want to store. Currently, we do it the other way around, and then we have systems to store data. And then when we have the systems to store data, we think about how do we make them interoperable? We should turn that around. Just a reminder from Michael Goodchild, who is, uh, I think maybe you don't know him to too many of you because he was out of, this, out of the field since I think like 15 years or so, but Gilberto knows him. <laughs> he's a he's a really great guy. He's the godfather of GIS and and many of the of the spatial sciences that we use to, and techniques that we use today. And he was writing this very remarkable preface in a couple of years ago, saying it's time to really look into that. So let me come to the conclusions. I think that's fine. Uh, yeah, IRD. Many questions open. That that's the slide I showed at the at the inauguration of the of the standards working group. Let's, let's talk about what we do first before we really set the standard. Uh, unfortunately, there is half of the slide missing here. I, those are the things about ARD that we have to keep in mind. It will not be one ARD, it will be several ARDs. We know that already, but how basically we will define the classes of ARD will have a huge impact of how we will be able to to get data interoperable and work with these data in, in the future. And as this is affecting the major providers, imagine OGC, CEOs, all the major space art agencies in one way or the other subscribe to that. We are looking at petabytes of data, hundreds of petabytes of data that are going to create it according to these standards. This is probably the most important decision that we are taking in, in, in the next two years. So it is something that uh, that is important where we pushed a lot to keep it open. This is not a standardization process as it's often, often happening. A group of experts goes to a back room and then comes back with the result. We insisted that this group is open, that everyone who wants to contribute can join. That's the lower part of this slide, which unfortunately is missing. You will see that later. If anyone from the OGC and CEOs can of course uh, uh, directly join this group, and, and if you are interested in none in any of these organizations, you can always contact me. I will make sure that you that you get in there if 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 you have ideas how to how to to make that that work. There is also an open GitHub where we will have discussions. Of course, ISO insists on on confidentiality, so the actual standard will only be published when it is ready. That's also the agreement with OGC. But anything like vocabulary, we, we can discuss in the open. We can, we can do with everyone else. So subscribe if you want to come in and, and follow the, Git, the GitHub channel if you think there might be discussions that are interesting of you. And two things that I would like to also in a meeting like this, and especially to the, to the younger colleagues, we hear much about user needs. And often it's said that's what we should put at the forefront. Yes, we should but we should take it with a grain of salt because otherwise this is, this is what happens. So it's unfortunately not really a historic statement, but uh, I think it, it just in, in one sentence captures the whole dilemma. If you, if, you, if you do exactly what people want, you might miss the real chance for innovation. And even if it's a good solution, even, even if, if you have something that is very nicely working and that would be a good idea, it's not said that it by, by itself will prevail because there are many things that, that, that can go wrong that have nothing to do with the quality of the solution. So always keep in mind that the things that, that are pushed are not necessarily the ones that are really, are, really, are really best. I think that's all I have to say.
Thank you very much, Peter, for the brilliant presentation. Now is the time for questions and answers. Uh, <clears throat> Peter, very nice, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, there's, let's say, two issues. One, I would argue that ARD in the SEALs definition and, and the agencies that follow that definition has been a success. You can write software that runs on the different platforms available and, and the results would be, if not exactly the same, certainly consistent between all of them, NASA, Microsoft, uh, Digital Earth Africa, SIPO, whatever. Now, the other point is data cubes, which brings to the issue of grids. I, I, I would argue that data cubes are application specific, at least for the moment, because data cubes are very much designed uh, with a certain kind of algorithm in mind. So if you are using, you say AI, but which AI? Uh, if you're using uh, convolutional neural networks for small 2D uh, images, like the guys in artificial intelligence per se, you need a certain data cube. If you're using one dimensional time series uh, convolutions, you need another kind of, of data cube. So uh, here is a situation where technology in terms of algorithms for AI, uh, for geo is evolving. So this is really a certain call for being a little bit more cautious uh, in trying to sort of standardize too early what the data cube should be, because the algorithms that underpin the usefulness of the data cube are evolving. And it's something to be, uh, be careful about uh, in order not to be overtaken have a definition and then the technology overtakes it and makes the definition and the standard, uh, which is less than usable than it should be. Thanks, I, I fully agree with you. And, and that one of the reasons is why, why I'm thinking into this is that I want to get the concept right before we really think about the standards and the implementation. And this is, this is just something that, that, I mean, what you saw here is essentially a lecture on theoretical earth observation, which unfortunately you will not find a very, a very f a common topic. Most people just take, take the data as they are and take them for given and start going into the pretty pictures. But we will have to do this other work as well. And I fully agree with you. It has to be done with, uh, per, with uh, having, having usage in mind. Yes, absolutely, and use cases. More questions, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Peter, for your great talk. Uh, so my question is on, in your opinion, why is a broader adoption of the DGGS not yet accomplished? Or what are the reasons data providers, or what could be potential reasons? It, it's very simple. It's exactly the slide you showed. It's outside the comfort zone. How, how can we push data providers more to the cloud? You're the expert for the comfort zone here. So <laughs> you tell me how we get the users through that fear zone into the, the, the future that lies behind. There is all indication that what comes behind is worth going through the fear zone. But, but I have not yet found, or I have not yet been convincing enough to get people through the fear zone. There are, there are movements, people penetrate into it, but we have not yet, we don't have the breakthrough and we need it soon. Is there, is there um, a good reference example where it has been implemented that can be shown as a, as a model or a good example? That is exactly the question. I mean, ESA has started looking into it, for example, for storage of Sentinel-2 data. They have done a pilot study and they looked at DGGSs and they found that well, there is not really the, 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 the DGGS that probably would be the, the, the best possible solution is not yet implemented. So they said, let's try with a less ideal one and see how that works. Of course, you don't get optimal results if you work with one that from the start, you know, is not really the one that, that is the best for your problem. So these studies are going on, but I still think they are done not with the, with the right resources and, and, and energy. But there are experts out there, the domain working group also slowly in Europe is growing. 
and Pangeo is looking into DGGS and, and I hope that something will emerge there. In the end to the user, I keep saying, these grids that we are talking about here are something that the users should never realize exist because what they, what they see on their, on their screens is anyhow rendered. You can render any grid from a computer to a screen and the user will not actually know what the original grid is until he zooms to the pixel level and he doesn't see his data then anymore. So what, what's the purpose of that? So I think it's, it's something that, that we, we, it's a fear zone. It's just something that, that people have to overcome and understand that it's not, go, it's not nothing bad. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> thanks also uh, for the talk. Uh, very, very interesting. I, maybe you wanted to make the point actually, but I, maybe I'm repeating it, but I think one, one thing that is important that came to me when you talked about this Equi 7 projection, I think one should really have the earth system perspective also when talking about these kind of things. That means, for example, not only thinking about land, but to think about land and ocean uh, together. So for, for if you think about that, then this projection is not, not very useful. And also the, the climate modelers have, of course, their grids, uh, eco-sahedral grids and so on. And I think some crosstalk uh, would be very helpful in this context to, to make it interoperable with a, with, a, with a climate modeling world. Uh, absolutely. By the way, the field where DGGS is currently implemented most is oceanography. Yeah. They really, because they have this problem that they want a connected grid that covers all the oceans. For land, you basically, you can always find sea and water where you can cut it. If you want to really model the whole ocean, you will find that it's connected over the globe. You need you need one system, and they 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 work with that more than the land people. Okay. Let's let's just see how many people use DGGS. How many people here? Let's. See. Can we have a talk? <laughs> it's not it's not too bad. It's a four five. Okay, happy so to see is, that there is some over this. Hey, can I just ask you just last question? So Modis. One of the you know big uh, Earth observation project now it's being a bit uh, phased out, but I remember when they started 2000, they published a paper and they say MODIS projection and HDF, and basically that's the they had to make the choices because when you build this, and do you think that they made a mistake or do you think? Well, that goes that goes time? back 20 years. We talk yeah, of yeah, different yeah, epoch. Yeah. But so, think? I would certainly. Uh, say that was not an uninformed choice, or that was also not a a, a wrong choice at at that period. Of course, it would at that time already have been easy in terms of the background. Most of these things were established in the nineties. The, the concept of DGGS goes back, I think, even even earlier to the eighties. So, in theory, it would have been possible to do it differently. But I, but I can understand that if you're under pressure, if you need to be pragmatic. If you don't have the right experts at hand and, and you don't have the means to find them or you don't succeed to find them in the time you have, that, that's the way it goes. So that's the past, but I think we are at a point now and, and, and those were volumes and, and amounts of data and technology in distributing data and working with data that is quite different from what we know we're gonna have and need to have in five to 10 years from now. Because I mean, when we see 20 terabytes today, this, the systems that we are currently designing Copernicus will deliver a factor five to 10 more in 10 years from now. Yep. So yep. We, need, we need to do something there. With the technology we have, I think we will come to a limit. Or we just store this, this data away and never, never really look at them. <laughs> <laughs>